Charles Schultz, the great cartoonist figure, Charlie Brown, it always seems to be alone. He's a lonely figure in that great uh, comic strip. And so is Charlie Brown, the command module right now, with John Young as its pilot, alone, with his uh, two compatriots on the flight of Apollo 10, now out there some distance from him in the lunar module. And I was wondering, Bill Stout and Leo Krupp out at North American uh, Rockwell in Downey, California, just what John Young's doing alone in the command module right now. Well, he may be alone, Walter, but he's certainly busier than ever, I, I would guess, at this point. Leo, how tough is it for one man to fly this ship after the other two have gone off on their own, in effect? Well, Bill, uh, John is flying the vehicle on automatic pilot, but he is quite busy. He's spending most of his time floating between the left couch here, where I'm in right now, and down to the lower equipment bay, because John is tracking the lunar module throughout this entire maneuver. He'll be using the sextant, which is a 28-power instrument, to uh, track the, the lunar module, and the lunar module has a blinking light on it. So he'll sight through that instrument, see the blinking light. If the blinking light is not in the center of the reticle at the time, he will take a hand controller down there and fly the optics to center the blinking light exactly in the center of the reticle of the sextant. When it's centered, then he presses a mark button, which sends that information to the computer. The computer accepts this information, and based on this, plus the VHF ranging, which John has up here on a, on a display in front of him, which you is see, also sent into the... Uh, explain VHF ranging to me. How, how is it used in this flight? Well, this VHF ranging, the command module sends a VHF radio signal to the lunar module. It's taken into the lunar module, turned around, and sent back to us, and we measure the time elapsed for the signal to go from the command module to the lunar module and back, and we convert that into distance. So at all times, uh, John Young will be reading out here the distance the lunar module is from him. For example, right now, the lunar module is 84.93 miles away on this instrument. The, uh, one of the interesting parts about John's task on this particular uh, LEM rendezvous is the fact that our maximum separation is going to be about 365 miles. Now, on Apollo 9, the maximum separation was about 98 miles. Uh, we're going to be right out near the limits of, of our optical tracking. Our data shows that we'll be able to see the blinking light out to 400 miles, so we're getting pretty close to the limit of, of visual tracking. But he isn't just watching it to uh, see what his friends are doing. There's a specific purpose, isn't there, in feeding all this back into the computer? Isn't he ready at any time to go after them if they need help? That's right, Bill. All this marking that he's doing, both with the optics and the VHF, is fed into our computer which is computing a solution for the next lunar module maneuver. Now, if anything should happen in the lunar module or they cannot perform their maneuver, John Young will be prepared within probably a minute or a minute and a half to do the mirror image or the opposite type of burn to maintain the relative motion between the two vehicles that would have occurred if the LEM had been able to perform its maneuver. Certainly, you people at North American Rockwell didn't build Apollo with a trip close to the moon's surface in mind, and yet it has that capability. Well, Bill, there's no atmosphere on the moon, so theoretically you could orbit the moon down to the altitude of the highest mountain peak. Uh, there's no uh, aerodynamic problems or heating problems like we have around Earth, so your orbit could be very low around the moon as long as you didn't impact one of the peaks. Mm -hmm. And Apollo could go down how low if it had to, to pull LEM out of trouble? Well, depending on where the LEM have its, has its problem, which uh, could be as low as 50,000 feet, we could affect a, a rescue at 50,000 feet. Would it be risky? I mean, it's not built into the flight plan or, or the program of things expectable. Would well, it, it is built into the flight plan, and uh, the crews have practiced uh, rendezvous both with the LEM active and with the command module active, so I'm sure John Young is very proficient in this maneuver, and if anything should happen, uh, I feel very confident that he will be able to perform the maneuvers properly. In effect, Big Brother pulling the little ones out of it. Yes. If it has to be done that way. Walter? That's everything, of course. Uh, Leo and Bill right up to a, uh, a, a force landing or a crash landing of the lunar module on the surface. If that happened, uh, there would be no rescue capability uh, for these uh, two pilots of the lunar module. Uh, speaking of uh, John Young, as the moon landing mission comes closer, of course, uh, most of the emphasis has been on the lunar module, the landing craft and its occupants, not on the command module pilot. But recently, Dave Schumacher asked John Young if he would prefer being in the lunar module. Actually, part of our work is to look out. Uh, you know, oddly enough, uh, 
the most important, exciting, if you want, of course, there's a lot of exciting periods in this flight, but uh, some of the most critical periods are those periods which there is the most to do. And this particular pass, the low pass over the landing site, is uh, one of those, those periods. Uh, one of our objectives, though, is, is uh, to, well, the first objective as we come across is a landing radar test. So we have to be in particular attitudes. Now, Tom is flying the spacecraft to give you an idea of this coordination. is flying the spacecraft and I'm running some computers during this period of time. We're also taking pictures of the first two available landing sites for the first lunar landing. And these pictures are very valuable and very important because never have we really seen an approach to the second one. And it's always nice to have seen where you're going before you go there. So we're taking those pictures, we're looking out, and you're right, it's gonna be hard to concentrate. I'd like to know what my words are gonna be. I only hope that they're adequate to describe what we see and what we feel uh, to those people who are listening. Well, that wasn't the interview by uh, Shoemaker that we expected. He was talking there to Eugene Cernan about the uh, landing site and the sighting of the uh, landing site. Uh, Cernan, not uh, Young. We talked about uh, what uh, is going on with John Young in the command module right now. Leo Krupp told us what he is doing. Let's uh, go out to Grumman Aircraft in Bethpage, Long Island, where they build the lunar module, and where Nelson Benton is with Scott McLeod, their test uh, astronaut. Uh, what are they doing now in the lunar module, gentlemen? Uh, Walter, we figure uh, the lunar module right now is uh, something a little over a half hour from that uh, first pass over the 50,000 foot point. Scott, uh, is it very busy uh, in LAM-4 right now? Well, yes. As Gene had just mentioned, they are going to use the landing radar and take some photographs. And of course, they're setting up for this. But in the meantime, as they're making their descent, they're checking the rendezvous radar and coming from the command module they're checking the range and range rate on these instruments to determine how fast they're going down toward the moon and how far away they are from the command module we might point out that uh, we read uh, rendezvous radar and uh, landing radar on the same uh, instrument it's just uh, flicking a switch to yes see which we can one select you. either one on that same instrument the site that uh, that uh, lem4 is approaching to a, a look at point right now is uh, landing point, landing site two, and this is uh, on the edge of the Sea of Tranquility. Is there anything magic about the Sea of Tranquility as a landing spot? Is it a nice place to visit, or are there other criteria, Scott? Well, yes, it's a nice place to visit in that it's a nice smooth landing spot, and that certainly is one of the criteria. Uh, one of the other ones is that the sun angle must be right, and therefore, because of the day you launch, the sun is in a certain position with respect to the moon, and that, give it, that gives us, as we make a landing on the moon, a sun angle over our shoulder of about 10 degrees. And we want a good approach toward it and a good it's ascent like a away. pass, you approach out of the sun. Well, that's not the reason. It's for visibility. Because if the sun was in front of you, obviously, you'd uh, have it right in your eyes and wouldn't be able to see. If it was directly overhead, then you would have no shadows, no good definition of the surface. I presume, too, there are some criteria attached to this landing site that are concerned with, with liftoff when the time comes to, uh, to leave them. Well, you want a good definition of your ascent path. So there would be something you recognize, like craters or mountains, as you are making an ascent also. And you would want to clear them, but you would want to be able to identify the path. And so, Walter, uh, Tom Stafford and Gene Cernan are going down for that first reconnaissance of the spot that's been picked for the main event this summer. Scott, uh, a great deal has been said about uh, pilot skill in this uh, very delicate operation that we're about to come up on. And incidentally, they acquire the signal in just 11 minutes from now as they come around uh, on the uh, near side of the moon again. Uh, uh, how much pilot skill, in the sense that they have injected themselves now uh, into an orbit that brings them into this low perigee, just 10 miles above the moon's surface, what can they do about it if those instruments read out that they're not precisely on that course? Well, Walter, I guess the pilot skill that we're involved in right now is evaluating all of the data that comes into them as pilots and then making the correct decisions and basing these decisions on their background experience as pilots and their training in the astronaut program. 
Can they do anything to alter that course down toward perigee uh, uh, in the spacecraft uh, at this point? Yes, they can. If everything goes wrong and they must go completely to manual, then they can go back up manually. Uh, if small things deteriorate, then they can take over or select a new program through the computer and abort their mission at any point. In other words, they, uh, instead of continuing the descent, would begin an ascent again? Yes. All right. Now, one other thing you mentioned there, uh, the sun angle. You know this uh, entire flight of Apollo uh, 10, as we have pointed out before, is on the exact timeline, that is on the same schedule precisely as the Apollo 11 mission, if it uh, continues to be planned as it is now, and probably would be. Uh, however, this flight is running 12 minutes behind its original schedule. That's because they did not make uh, all of the mid-course corrections that were needed, and uh, they arrived at the moon 12 minutes early, or uh, 12 minutes late. So this uh, 12 minutes will make a slight difference in the sun angle on the landing site as to that preferred for Apollo 11. However, the degree of the sun's difference in that 12 minutes is so small, so teeny, that uh, it really will not make a critical difference in what they see from Apollo 10 and what will be seen from Apollo 11. Let's now try to pick up uh, John Young's comments on whether he'd prefer to be in the lunar module. Well, uh, at this point in time, I, I don't think I would. I've got a fascinating job in the command module. I get to do a lot of things, and uh, I'm pretty well wrapped up in it. It's a, it's a fascinating job uh, running a spacecraft all by yourself. It uh, keeps you busy. The tasks that I've got to do in there are, are varied. There's no two alike. I'm doing something different every minute, and uh, I think I wouldn't trade places right now with anybody. You just stay in a couch, or do you move around a lot to keep track of them? No, flying a three-man spacecraft when you're by yourself is uh, keeps you moving around. You have to check the systems, you have to check the guidance uh, performance, you have to to operate the computer, the autopilot, and the controls if you have to do uh, thrusting maneuvers, turn the engines on and off, and so that keeps you in all uh, that keeps you in three different places in the spacecraft at the same time almost. A lot easier in zero gravity than in uh, simulations. And with seven and a half minutes before signal should be acquired again as they come back on this side of the moon, CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment.